Hola, hola. Buenas tardes a todos. Soy Natalie Baclini. Everybody, my name is Natalie Baclini, and I'll be joining you for this webinar. I'll be your moderator. Over the past few years, I've had the opportunity. I've been able to work with Canada and Mexico in the field of marketing, collaborating in with entrepreneurs from the creative industry in both countries. And so it's an honor for me to be able to be a part of Panorama Creativo, Creative Panorama, uh, which is a product that the government of Canada through its embassy in Mexico has, and in it, the uh, government of Canada through its embassy in Mexico has selected Centro to develop a map of the creative ecosystem in Mexico and gather data regarding the main stakeholders in graphic design, editorial design, textile design and fashion, interactive media, audiovisual media, and the performing arts. It will be very useful in order to be able to determine the synergies that can be established between our two countries. Today, we're continuing with our webinar cycle in which we're going to be trying to approach Canadian companies that are interested in the Mexican creative industry and want to have conversations with Mexican experts. By the way, the official language of the webinar is in Spanish and there will be simultaneous interpretation available into English and French. At the end of the session, we'll have a 10 minute Q&A session as well as having a chat box where or rather a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen where you can pose your questions. So if you have any questions, please, you can start writing them down. And at the very end of the session, we'll try to answer them. Let's begin this conversation. But first, I would like to thank the representative from the government of Canada. We'd like to welcome Sasha Lavasseur Clivard, who is the Minister of Public Affairs, Education and Culture at the Canadian Embassy in Mexico. Welcome, Sasha. Thank you very much, Sasha. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sasha Lavasseur. I'm the person. I'm the minister in, in charge of public affairs and education and culture at the embassy here, Canadian embassy here in Mexico. Thank you very much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you here with in joining us in this event. We also have the backing of the um, Heritage Ministry of Canada, in addition to that of the Canadian embassy. The idea is to have a map of the industry in Mexico for any company that might be interested in working with Mexico. And of course, all of this is being done with the trade representatives of Canada that can provide you with aid at the international level. In 2019, so right before uh, the pandemic started, Mexico has produced 216 movies which have been uh, screened on almost 8,000 screen screens all around the countries. Although COVID-19 has been particularly challenging for the film industry, production services and online distribution have seen a significant recovery in the past few months. A brand new Mexican federal government's plan to support the film industry, Netflix investing 300 million US dollars in Mexican productions, and the recent merge of Univision and Televisa, the largest media holdings in the Spanish speaking world are all potential signs of uh, recovery for the sectors. On espère que vous obtiendrez de l'information utile lors de la séance d'aujourd'hui. Hésitez We hope this information has been the information that will be provided to you will be useful and if you have any questions you can either approach me or Ernesto Miranda in case you have any questions you would like to pose. And creative industries prepared by Centro will be published over the summer and will for sure include all the ideas and reflections of uh, today's discussion. Muchas gracias a todos y todas. Les deseo bonita tarde, buena sesión. Good luck, everybody. I hope you have a good session. Thank you very much, Sasha, for your kind words. Let's begin the session, the conversation with Fernanda Del Monte, who is an expert in her field. She is in charge of transmedia narratives and a professor of script writing at Centrum. Thank you very much, Natalie. Hello, good morning, everybody. In this, in this first segment, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the data that I think Sasha referred to very briefly with regard to the audiovisual industry in Mexico. 
The audiovisual media sector represents 36.8% of Mexico's GDP and that it's grown 5.6% over the past few years. Most definitely, I would be able to say that the technological side and the new platforms that we have available in Mexico, this, these new distribution channels have increased the audience for our audiovisual media. Today, I hope we can focus a little bit more on what we can do between Canada and Mexico in the knowledge that Mexico has enormous growth potential, which over the years, over the past decades, has because we have always been an audiovisual country. We have uh, broadcast TV broadcast companies. We have a significant film industry. We've participated in many international film festivals. So Mexican the Mexican film industry and the entire audiovisual industry has a significant position globally. And so it would be a good idea to talk about the possible relationship and possible growth we could see in the sense of what Canada and Mexico could do. Later on, I'll tell you a little bit more about that and I'll ask all of the other guests and panelists to refer to that subject as well. Up on the screen, you see some of the numbers. Sometimes I, there's really no, I feel that it's really not necessary to repeat them, but I would just like to mention that exports and imports from between Mexico and Canada are significant. As you can see, Mexico exports 99.7, million CADs to Canada, and we export 68.1, and Canada exports 68.1 CAD to Mexico. All of this just goes to show that there are still a lot of possibilities of finding new markets where your narratives, your stories can be seen and can be distributed in other countries. And I think that that's a very important that we should bear in mind. There are other data that are very important. For example, if you bear in mind that in Mexico, when you talk about the film industry and the way in which we could view all the Mexi the, all the Canadian products, bear in mind that our population uh, is 126.5 million. And we have 341 million people who go to the movies per year. That was That's for 2019, which means that the Mexican audience is an audience that is very interested in seeing films, series, TV programs, and this applies to the Canadian market. I think it's important that you know that. The fact that we're the country that is positioned fourth in terms of the number of movie tickets sold globally prior to the pandemic, of course. With the pandemic, the need to use digital platforms has increased significantly. More and more people buy and have access to platforms such as Netflix, Claro Video, Claro Video as well as many others. And we also know that Mexico has 168 film festivals. Every year we release 454 films all of which points to the fact that in terms of the distribution of na Canadian narratives here in Mexico, you would have a, an enormous field that you can explore. Knowing that Mexico has all of these film festivals and has all of these different spaces that can be used for an exchange between our two countries that might be much more specialized or much more focused on what Canada produces and what Mexico produces. By providing you with all of these numbers, I just want to remind you of the cross-border relationship we have. I think that there's still much that we can do in terms of the uh, topics that we share amongst our two countries, including this uh, transnational border that we both share with the U.S. And also bear in mind the fact that there are many Mexican workers that work in Canada, but have their home country here in Mexico. So there are a lot of connections between our two countries. And I think we should remember that. Perhaps later on, I'll, can, I can tell you a little bit more about that. But for now, I think I would conclude my remarks. And I would like to ask Natalie to please be so kind as to welcome the other guests. Thank you.
Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you very much for giving us that general overview of, of the sector. Bearing in mind what you've just told us, I would love it if each one of our guests please, could please tell us in their own experience, what is what are the characteristics and what are the needs of the audio visual sector in Mexico? And to start off, I'd like to welcome Elena Fortes, who is the co-founder of Ambulante and No Ficción, which is a production company. Could you please tell us in your own experience, Elena, how is Mexico positioned globally through its film festivals? And I would also like to ask you to tell us how these are opportunities for Canadian producers to be able to work more closely with Mexico. Thank you very much, Elena, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Hello, everybody. Well, the number of festivals that we have nowadays doesn't compare to when I started out in the industry in 2005, when we created Ambulante. There were just six festivals at the time, six festivals at the time. But now, as you just heard, there are 168 film festivals. And I think that to a, de a big degree, that increase in the number of film festivals is because of a need which I think is, is still very important, even when we're working with the virtual platforms. And that is that we want to have very diverse content and we want to have networks, alternative networks, so that we can broadcast our products. I think that we've been up to a point very much monopolized in terms of the possibilities of showing our films working only with certain studios and perhaps because of algorithms also through just some platforms. So I think that what happened with the increase in the film festivals that were created was because we wanted to reach different types of audiences, particularly to be able to provide them with different type of content. In the case of Ambulante, we focused more on documentaries, but it was because we knew that there was a significant audience for documentaries and that we had to be able to move to be able to reach, move around the country to be able to reach them. So the idea has been so far to develop strategies so that we can reach different audiences and maybe go beyond just the film and the cultural world and connect, I don't know, uh, films with um, cyclists, for example, bikers or with music. So there can be a combination of different types of activities that could connect different types of disciplines, not just in the world of culture. And the audience, at least in the time in which I was with them between 2006 and 2016, was one in which we saw a growth of more than 650% in, for documentaries, that is. I think that there are also a lot of festivals and each one of them has their own identity and they've had significant repercussions globally. There have been festivals in Mexico that have uh, that gather a significant portion of the of a certain type of market. For example, in Los Cabos, it's U.S. market. There are other festivals, for example, such as Ambulante, in which they focus on discovering audiences and to let the creators contact the audiences themselves. It's not like a festival in which they're just focusing on the industry. Rather here, they're focusing on the general public. And so because of the experience that producers, programmers, critics, representatives from film festivals can have in Mexico, I think it would be very important for us to continue in that vein. And now with, the, with these new platforms and because of the pandemic, there has been there have been significant changes. We have to learn how to adapt without losing the essence of these festivals because it's it's always very different when you sit in front of a screen. I, I, keep to, I keep defending that position, even in spite of the pandemic, hopefully things will change afterwards, but we also have to take advantage of the virtual channel so that we can reach other types of public and have another type of, of uh, meeting of the minds. I think that for the it's very important to bear all of this in mind for future film festivals and how we can adapt and have new opportunities, even within this context, so that we can see the industry grow and to continue to work with creators from other parts of the world. 
getting back to the issue of diversity, I think that offering of different types of contents and that diversity of contents is something that as an industry we're always interested in. We want to be able to reflect that diversity in the voices that are behind the camera, the voices of the creators of those festivals is, are very important as well. And, and perhaps that's something we can talk about a little later on. Great. Thank you very much, Elena, for your comments. Very, valu very valuable comments. We also have Fernando Rovsar with us. He is the co-founder and creative director of Lemon Studios. Now let's welcome Fernando. Fernando, could you please tell us, give us a general overview of the production and distribution of content through digital platforms. We know that it's a sector that is obviously growing. So we were wondering if you could tell us how Mexico is positioning itself globally and how, what type of a strategy it's using, uh, that, what type of strategy can be used to enter the Spanish speaking market. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Elena was talking about her experience and how things have changed over the past 20 years. And I think it's absolutely true what you just said that that things have changed. When we started in 2000, only seven films were made in Mexico. And now that number has increased to 220 in a single year. Recently, Netflix announced that, it, that in 2021, it would be investing $300 million in Mexico in a number of different projects, and not just Mexican, but also uh, local or global uh, projects, but that will be filmed in Mexico. HBO Max has also recently announced that this year and next year, they'll have 100 original productions in Mexico and Latin America over the next two years. And the same has happened with Amazon, Paramount Plus. And I think that what we see now is that we've been asking in Mexico for this opportunity for a long time. And now with the push of a button, our contents can be seen all over the world, 195 countries. Quien Mató Sara, which is a series, was first in 40 countries, including not uh, Spanish-speaking Spanish -speaking countries, in other countries. And so what do I think about the current outlook and the industry right now? Well, I think we're, this, is, this is the best time of our lives right now. But I think that there are a lot of opportunities for us to strike up partnerships. We know that we can continue to expand and we can continue to build bridges. I'm always very surprised by the fact that we have such a strong connection with the US in many ways, and the US has a very strong connection with Canada. But I think that we, there's still much to do between Mexico and Canada. We still have to have a lot more conversations such as this one, have many more conversations, because I think we're going to realize that we have a lot more in common with each other than things that separate us from each other. But above all, I think that the content that we're currently developing in Mexico for export is a content that speaks a lot of specifically of Mexico. And we are finding that the wealth of each country and each individual is being welcomed in countries that we thought were completely different from us. And so I believe that what we could now offer as Mexicans is not just to tell Mexican stories. As we saw recently, two Mexicans uh, won an Oscar for sound. And there are also directors and photographers that have won awards all over the world. And we've seen that talent is something that as, as, a, as happens in soccer, we're finding a way to export and import talent, export and importing, because we also want Canadian talent to come to Mexico. For you to come and see the possibilities that there that we have here in Mexico, the wealth of, of, of things that we can do, the talent available to you, and the, how skilled we are, and how willing and excited we are to tell new stories. So I believe that the best is yet to come for all, all of our countries that are developing content and exporting it through digital platforms. But obviously, this year has also been very tough on the film industry. I, my heart broke when 
I heard that Arclight had Don Under and uh, others as well, in addition to AMC here in Cinemex, they've also had problems. Cinepolis is trying to stay above water, but, but most definitely uh, the film industry is having a tough time, but it, they're all, they'll always be there. It'll be the place where we can have an experience that we can share with our friends, with our family, where we disconnect from the rest of the world and which, in which we can open a window into another part of the world. And so what I would love to do is see more Canadian films in Mexican um, film, uh, theaters. And the same goes for Mexican films in Canadian theaters. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your passion, your vision, and for telling us about the possibilities. To conclude this first block, in which we had a general overview, we'd like to ask Miguel Alvarez, who is the technical coordinator of IMCINE, who will be telling us from the point, from the his point of view, from the institutional point of view. Thank you very much, Jose Miguel. Welcome all of the Canadian companies participating in this event and hello to all of my fellow panelists. I represent IMCINE, which is the Mexican Institute of Cinematography. We are the public organization that is in charge of encouraging Mexican film. Uh, we still don't have anything for the audiovisual industry, but we hope we're going to get there at some point. And so you've heard about the, the fact that the industry, the film industry is very healthy, that how it plays such an important role in our economy. And yes, we've seen that our budget has increased 2.7% uh, compared to last year. We create 31,000 jobs in my industry. And so this just goes to speak of the strength of the industry. Obviously, this is bearing in mind the pandemic, but we know that we'll be able to overcome the pandemic and that all of the creative and cultural industries will be able to revive their activities very quickly and once again have income in the short term. I would like to make a few comments regarding the production data here in our country. You heard that in 2019, there were 216 feature films that were filmed and 105 of them were done without any public assistance. This is something that happened for the first time. In the previous years, there were more films that had been um, backed by public funds, more so than private funds. And this just points to the fact that that industry can be very healthy, that the film industry and the audiovisual industry can be very healthy. The, the UNESCO says that the countries that have the most in the, the strongest industries is because they have a lot of backing from their governments. That's something that happens in Mexico and I understand in Canada because I think we both believe that those uh, creative industries are extremely important for our countries and for our economies. And in, in CINE, we hope to be able to help everybody in all of their stages and all of their needs. We've also got some good news in the sense that in 2019, we had, we sold 35.2 million tickets to see Mexican films, which is 10% of all of the tickets bought in our country. And that's a record number for our country. And so it would seem that the Mexican film industry is having a boom as was, as was the case in the golden era in the previous century. As to the role of IMCINE, we provide assistance in all stages from the creation all the way to the exhibition or the showing of the, uh, of the film. We help with the development of the products, with the training for workshops, for everything that is required in the film and audiovisual industry and for production. We have a new program to provide assistance, which is called FOCINE, F O. CINE in which there have been calls issued with nine of them focusing on production in different fields, either for children or documentaries, uh, animation, um, opera primas, uh, films in the States, um, documentaries and so on. So we're trying to provide the necessary assistance that are required to be able to help them. And we also have the EFICINE, -E 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 which also provides 500 million pesos, which is like 40 million CADs, to help with the production of feature films, documentaries, animation, amongst others. We also provide assistance to showings, 
through our programs and we do this to be able to increase the audience that we reach. And I mentioned this because all of these funds are available for international cooperation if we were ever to do anything with our Canadian partners as well as any other country. Thank you very much, Jose Miguel. Moving on to the second stage of the event, I'd like to provide you with a few, with a little bit more of information regarding the industry. Jose Miguel had just told you about the assistance being, pri being provided by IMCINE as well as EFICINE. There, if IMCINE, if for example, is a public institution, but there are other forms of cooperation that are both public and private. Private investment in the industry, as you can see in the graph, represents almost 50% of all investment, which points to the fact that the audiovisual sector, film, platforms, TV, also has a lot of private investment in it. I would like to briefly tell you a little bit about television and audiovisual platforms. Mexico, is historically one of the countries that has the largest audience, not just in because of our population, but also because we love to watch TV and movies. I think we're a very audiovisual culture. Television is, as it says up here, it's, it's a service. And we estimate that 90% of Mexican households have access to local TV, 50% of Mexican audiences also watch pay TV. Televisa and TV Azteca are two of the more important groups for Latin America. And I think that in that sense, Mexico is the entryway into the Spanish speaking community because of Televisa and TV Azteca and because there are so many companies that bring their content to Mexico and then afterwards continue distributing to, to the rest of the continent, to the south of the continent. And now we also have platforms. Mexico, as I've been saying, not only has a very big audience of its own, but it's also the country that opens the door to the south. And I think it's a very important gateway for Latin America. 92% of those that have platforms in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Colombia, and Peru, have more than one subscription or, or more than one subscription to a platform. That all points to the fact that we definitely are talking about a field that's growing in which many things are happening. And perhaps in that sense, but Elena can now tell us a little bit about how access to platforms has been handled. Netflix, for example, we know that Netflix has 93% preference, Claro Video, and then we have YouTube, Amazon Prime Video, as well as Blim. These are the most uh, popular digital platforms. I think somebody is asking how we can have exchanges, what type of spaces are available to be able to exchange content and production. And to answer that question, I'd like to ask Elena to please tell us a little bit about her project, which is entitled No Ficción, Nonfiction, which she's involved in, in addition to Ambulante, which she's no longer involved with, but she's now working with No Ficción. So tell us a little bit about your new project, Elena. Thank you. Well, this project, is an experiment of documentary and fiction. Luis Palacios is the director, and so we decided to do the this weird combination because he used to focus on fiction, although he would use some documentary strategies, especially when dealing with his actors. And for me and Daniela, because we both founded No Ficción. This is the first time we're going to enter the world of non of, of fiction. And so the, the idea was to try to understand the crisis, impunity crisis that we have here in Mexico. But then afterwards, we decided to focus on the police because that's the 
connection that we have with this dysfunctional system that we have, and it's the weakest link. And there's a, it's, it's very controversial because of so many um, police, so much police brutality we've seen. And so we wanted to understand uh, um, police officers. And so the, the, we follow a love story of two um, members of the police force and what led them to become members of the police force, um, what they were doing and how they ultimately decided to remove themselves from the police force and the story of our actors who were, and the story of the two actors that were uh, auditioning for the, for the roles and how they had to get prepared, how they were out on the streets patrolling with the, with the police so that they could really understand what it means to be a, a police officer in Mexico. And so it, it was a, it's a very interesting narrative. And, the, and the, it took us five years to film the movie. What's more, we still haven't even concluded it, although it was already um, released at the Berlin Film Festival. And we'll also be working with other hybrid film festivals over the next few months. Netflix this time around has already got pretty much the finished product, but the idea is to give it to Netflix because for us, what's most important is to be able to reach a large audience. And in that sense, the, the reach of Netflix is the biggest that we can achieve. And they're also very committed to the idea of trying to diversify their content and their narratives. So that's something that really appealed to us and we're on in, in those conversations with them. There are other productions that we have with Netflix because we have five documentary films with different Mexican directors, one of whom had, had more than 2 million views. That was uh, Lorena from, uh, who had a Raramuri film. And it was one in which we, we envisioned it jointly and outside of the context of that platform, I don't think it would ever have had that reach. I mean, even if it had participated in all of the festivals of the world, it wouldn't have had that same audience. And I think that the, these types of platforms are very important because above all, as documentaries, they've helped to create a new audience or public that doesn't divide people because I think that's something that was happening to the genre. But now we, we're trying to experiment with all of the possibilities at No Ficción. And then the last project is called Midnight Family, which is a co-production with the US and Netflix about a family that has an ambulance here in Mexico. And as Fer was saying, we are totally open to the possibilities of having co-production with Canada. I don't think we should just view it as in terms of where the film is going to be filmed or the narrative, we should also bear in mind the talent that we have in both our countries. This film I'm telling you about was one in which, yes, um, the, the filming was done in, in Mexico, but all of the talent for sound production was done here in Mexico. And, part, and there were also some things done in the US. And I think, I think I think that that's something that as an industry, we have to really look into, look into all the possibilities that we can have. Great, thank you very much, Elena. The, the, the project sounds fantastic and it seems like it has a lot of potential. Thank you for sharing that. Continuing with the event, let's talk a little bit about success stories. And so now I'd like to ask Fernando once again from Lemon Studios to tell us what success stories you could share with us, especially in terms of international partnerships to be able to work with Canadian companies. Well, I'd love to. I think, I think that the status of the Mexican audiovisual industry is one of great success. And I'm very pleased to hear right now that 10% of the tickets sold were for Mexican films. That percentage would have been impossible to even imagine a few years back. And it speaks to the fact that in the past, we didn't believe, we didn't really believe that we could be as good as others. 
And so we would never expect more than two or 3% of the tickets sold. But now with the changes we've seen, and I see this at Centro because I give classes at Centro, when I see aspiring showrunners, what I see in them is that, that they have something that I didn't have in my generation. I think that the, what the students at, the, at Centro have shown us that they've realized that there is talent and that that talent and that you don't have to look elsewhere for that type of talent. We have that talent here and you can offer that talent to the rest of the world. So I totally agree with Elena in the sense that a Canadian production could come to Mexico to look for a sound engineer, not just because it's they're Mexican, but because they're good. And I think that there are a lot of natural opportunities. For example, if my film is going to be recorded in, uh, is going to be about Canada, it should be filmed in Canada. But there are other opportunities for us because of all of the talents, because of all the creative professionalism we have in here. That's what allows our countries to make sure that the sandbox from which we take our pieces in which we're, with whom we're going to be working gets a lot bigger. And so there are a lot of talent, camera, photograph, photography, sound, all of that. To be, all of that can be found in both our countries. We hope to have these types of co-productions in the future. In the past, we would, maybe 15 years ago, we would only work with films. And our first partner was Canada. Oh no, not too, I wish, it was Spain. And what happened with Spain was very interesting because what we managed to do in the project was to see things with new eyes, to be able to read, uh, uh, critique and change the script. We saw another industry that works with different uh, rules and we learn things here in Mexico. And when we realize how things are done in other countries, I think we improved our own industry. The numbers that you just heard from Imcine are also due to the fact that all of our filmmakers worked in other countries, they went to other festivals, they sold their films in other countries, and we realized how things were being handled in the rest of the world, and we felt less isolated in terms of, 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 of the rules that we used to have in our own industry. And so with these co-productions that we had with Spain in 2000, we realized that we could, in the film side, co-finance projects, make them a lot more profitable, share the risk with other countries, and also bring together talent in front of the camera so that more than one country could see our content as local content, strong local content, so that we could have, let's see, two premieres, um, two premieres here. In soccer, it would be like having two two stadiums and two teams and the advantage of ha having that available to us. <clears throat> and I think that with the platforms, all of the projects that Mexico work with are, are basically international partnerships because none of these platforms are exclusively Mexican. Uh, let's see what happens with Televisa and Univision and even then. In any case, what I feel is that in these, in these types of international partnerships, what we're achieving is to continue to do what we've done in the past. The success that Mexican series have had in the entire world has have opened the door for people in Canada to be able to think that a Mexican project would be able to reach first place in platforms from in, in countries that have nothing to do with Mexico or that seem to have nothing to do with Mexico. And I think that in that sense, everything can be very attractive. Before the world of platforms, we used we worked with HBO, US for a few years, we had uh, a series called Senor Avila, and it was a series that nobody in Mexico wanted to produce back then because there was TV Azteca and Televisa, and that was a public TV or a local TV, and it was hard to be able to compete because you had to be able to struggle very hard to be able to get a slot in those 24 hours. And so the it was the audience uh, that decided what to do and when to watch it. And that's what changed the world. With Senor Avila, we were very much surprised with this collaboration that we had because we had this series that won an international Emmy and not, not because it was in the category of Latin America in the series, it was best primetime series in the US, which was 
an oddity that a product uh, written in Argentina and filmed in Mexico would have the greatest success, not in Mexico nor in Argentina, rather on prime time in the US. So well, each film is a different universe, every series, every, every one of these are new opportunities to strike up partnerships and have alliances and continue to grow. And I think it's really exciting to be able to perhaps work with Canada. And I think it would be exciting to be able to find co-productions in not so much in the common places, rather for us to understand that we're two very creative countries and that we want to push our industries and that we still have a lot of stories to tell each other. I think that's the most important part. And I think it's very interesting. So what uh, better proof of success is the fact that we are having this conversation right now. The fact that you even want to have this conversation about is already a success story for both our industries. Great, great. Thank you very much, Fernando. I know that you'll be very successful and I know that there are a lot of possibilities for you and I'm sure that the audience must be very excited. Also remember that we're almost approaching the end of this conversation. So if you have any questions, please start to write them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen of the Zoom screen so that we can have a more interactive conversation and explore new possibilities. But in the meanwhile, while we wait for you to write your questions, as we approach the end of this conversation, I would now like to ask Jose Miguel to please tell us a little bit about the collaboration and co-production models that can be established with Mexico to encourage the growth of the audiovisual market. You have the floor, Jose Miguel. Thank you very much. I'm so happy because I'm learning so much from everybody. And as to what your question, yes, uh, production is growing. We have realized, Mexicans have realized that were that international co-productions are good, not only in terms of financing projects, but also because they will offer us more opportunities to be able to show them elsewhere. For example, in 2019, we had 42 international co-productions, which was 20% uh, of all production. And in the past, it had been 30%. And we did it afterwards with, um, with 23 countries, in first place, we had the US, then followed by Spain, and then Argentina, and sometimes also followed by Colombia. And uh, unfortunately, Canada was not amongst the main co-productions. Although we have had Canadian co-productions such as Fausto, which was released in 2019, directed by Andrea Busman and co-produced by Miguel, Miguel Ángel Pereira, who lives in Canada. And we also have 49 series in 2019, and all of them were international co-productions. And as to the re Mexican releases in Canada over the past 11 years, 35 Mexican films were released in Canada, which makes Canada one of the uh, top 11 buyers of our products. Mexico has agreements, production agreements with 20 different countries obviously with Canada, but also with France, Spain, Switzerland, 13 countries in Latin America, and we're part of Inmedia, which is this Ibero-American program to back the film industry. Canada has 53 co-production agreements at last time I counted, and so you have, uh, you, you've got an edge on us in that sense. And as I said, the public funds, there are a lot of funds that are available for production, which is 50 million, which amounts to 50 million Canadian dollars. And they're open for the possibility of working with crew, talent, directors that are international. So it can be directed by a Canadian that gets uh, public funds through a Mexican uh, production company. And so it's all there. We have a co-production agreement between Mexico and Canada that was signed in 91. I hope you are familiar with it. And as they tend to facilitate the fact that films can have the nationality from both countries so that they can take advantage of the benefits to be had in both countries. In this case, they have a, um, a combination of 2080 of, in terms of the citizens from each country that have to be used. And they can be filmed in a country that is neither Mexico nor Canada. They can also be in English, French, or Spanish. And well, 
there are a lot of other details. We are making an effort to modernize and update that agreement, working with Canada Heritage to make it more appealing because unfortunately it hasn't been used as much. The good thing about these types of agreements is that the directors and teams of both our countries can have a rapprochement, which is why we continue to show our films in each other's festivals. We will continue to do so. We want to welcome you, and hopefully you'll be able to come to one of our festivals at some point, and perhaps at some point we can establish a partnership or show some signs of interest in collaboration through Canadian Media Fund, as well as through IMCINE. And remember that we also have a directory of producers. So it, if you want, we can also put you in contact with producers in our country. We also have international cooperation with uh, Canada. We have a memorandum of, understand, of understanding with the Canada Media Fund. And to conclude, I would say 10, I would say why you should do work with us. One, because of our talent. We, as you've seen, we have a lot of talent. We also have a very robust uh, uh, industry in all of the chains and links. We're all, we, all have, we also have a lot of different uh, uh, scenery. We have the necessary infrastructure, vanguard teams and equipment. We have a strategic geographic position. It, we're accessible. It's easy to fly in and out of the country. We also have very competitive prices because of the exchange rate. Also because we have Mexican funds that are open for co-production. We also have a, a, a film a commission, a film commission that will help you to guide you on the way of, that you need to take. And we also add, we don't add a value added tax. Whatever you do here, you don't have to pay the value added tax on it. And we also work with ATA so that you can import equipment. So in summary, the table is set for you to come in and we would be more than happy to have collaboration with Canada. I'd now like to ask our colleagues to all turn on their cameras. Please, everybody turn on your cameras so we can have the last few minutes to make some final comments. In this last segment, I think it's important for us to see how we can create a synergy and, and, and build bridges. There are a lot of cultural similarities between our two countries. If the table is set as Jose Miguel was saying, if both our countries are interested and we have the necessary infrastructure, and if Mexico is growing, the question, the very important question would be, what are the, um, how can we make sure that Mexico and Canada have a, uh, understand that they have a similar cultural um, background instead of, we shouldn't stop, we shouldn't talk about the past anymore. I think the two things that we have to bear in mind, one is, for example, that we've realized that there's a lot of cultural diversity in Mexican content and that stories in Mexico shouldn't just focus on having a national identity, which is what we used to do in the past, but rather in terms of the content, the stories that we can tell in Mexico and, and that exist in Mexico are very multicultural. That is to say, Mexico is a heterogeneous country. It's a lot more than we, we might believe. It's, we're not a country that, that can only talk about three different topics. We can talk about a large number of topics. And since I've had the opportunity of working in Canada, the same thing, I've seen that the same thing can be said about Canada. It's a multicultural, multilinguistic country, just like Mexico. And so the proposal I would make is that we think about the co-creation of scripts. I think that's very important and it would be extremely interesting for us to be able to create um, cross content, uh, transcultural contents, things that happen both in Mexico and Canada that are realistic, and it reflect they reflect a, a transnational reality and the multicultural nature of our two countries. So, I think that the industries are ready, the the possibilities that are there, and so now we just have to start to build the bridge. I think the content, the topics, the stories are a little bit of the things that we can do to be able to create a much closer relationship between Mexico and Canada. 
and then with that we'll be able to increase our audiences that's just something i wanted to uh, put on the table as my opinion but now i'd like to ask my colleagues if they would like to make their final comments you have the floor whoever wants to take it that's that's very interesting obviously everything starts with with an idea with a story with with the um with the um, script, if there's a script. I think maybe a good start for building this bridge is that it's true, we can create new stories, but also we have to be able to share the stories we already have, and not just the things that have already been filmed. I'm talking about all this whole portfolio of scripts that are available because sometimes people write a script, they, you, they put them away in a drawer because you figure that the industry won't be able to use it or, or, or because you think that you need more opinions about your script. I, for example, have written two series in front of the screen during the pandemic and it dealt with Mexico and the US. And, and I was successful, I was creatively successful because although the first time everybody was wondering how are we going to be creative in front of a screen, we realized that it can be done and, and it, it, it has been done. You can overcome the distance that separates us. And maybe sometimes we were afraid to cross that border in the past and that no longer exists. So I would like to know if there is a bank of Canadian scripts, maybe like a, a blacklist or a, or a market hub or something, something so that as a Mexican creator, if I want to search by genre or something, I can look for scripts. Maybe there, there are scripts out there that need a home. And we would like to offer the same thing about Mex for Mexican scripts because that's something that we could do with like Black Market or Film Market Hub, and that would be a good start of a conversation. And if you don't like the idea, okay, fine, no problem. No, I'm sorry, I was just looking at the time. We've only got six minutes left, but there are a few questions. So would you mind if I start asking questions or would anybody like to add anything to what Fernando just, just said or should we just move on to the questions? Questions, please. Great. And remember, if you're listening, you'll be getting all of the data that we're sharing today at the end of the webinar series. There's a question for Fernando. Do you think that collaboration between Mexico and Canada would be just in terms of production or content? Yes, yes, we could have collaboration in content, ideas, scripts, music, production. You never know where a project is going to start up. You, you don't know what the source of inspiration of a project is. It can, it can be a song, a story, um, an article in the paper. And that happens all over the world. And so what we're looking for is to find a way between a, a way to communicate between Mexico and Canada to inspire each other, to trigger, trigger the creation of a new project. And it, if, if you want to film in the Caribbean, we have wonderful beaches in Mexico. But in Mexico, there is a lot more that we can offer. And I'm sure that the same thing can apply for what Canada can offer Mexico. Great. This is another question. What, what productions would you say best represent our country over the past uh, few years, in addition to the ones you have already mentioned? Elena, you take that, please. I wouldn't want to take it. Well, I think that people are very focused on Diego, Gael, uh, the three Mexican directors, but um, there are also a lot of new voices on the scene. And so what I would say is that there's a, a film by Natalia Almada, which was uh, released in Sundance, Losers, uh, Alonso, 
also is one of the big voices. And they, he, he had a release of um, a fiction release recently. But most of all, what I think that we shouldn't just focus on the, these other Mexican voices that have been on the market for many years. I think that we also should start to look at at the national and international level at new talent. Great, thank you. Okay, there are another two questions. What advantages do you see in collaboration between Mexico and Canada with regard to Kuzma? I think that's a question for Jose Miguel. Well, in terms of trade, and what happens with um, people and talent. I think the idea is to collaborate between our two countries within the framework of collaboration. I think that's something that, that is very important, uh, whether or not we have a free trade agreement. We love the way Canada is always protecting its creative industry. And I think that Mexico should also be doing the same but there's always a lot of opportunities to collaborate between our two countries. And so, yes, I think that, if, I mean, if we're talking about customs and, and tax incentives, that's very important, but I think that it's more important to remember what people and what companies can offer each other. Yes, I have a question. Is it difficult for a Mexican to work in Canada temporarily on a project or to go study there? And I would also have another question. Is it hard for Canadians to come to Mexico to do the same thing? I mean, in terms of visa, all the migration paperwork that has to be filed, that's, that's always an issue. So in that sense, would it be easier that I think is a question that should be answered by the embassy. I, I can't seem to hear you. Just joking. It's a little complicated as a question, but I don't know if my colleague Ernesto is there. Maybe he could say something about those types of details. Yes, he's there. Uh, because since we're running out of time, Sasha, we've only got a minute left. Since we're going to be sending a report at the very end of the series, if you want, we can have a list of all of the challenges and all of the guidelines that you can uh, follow in order to be able to overcome any problems. And we'll also be providing you with the contact info from in the Canadian embassies to help you resolve any of those types of issues, okay? Okay, so then just one final question before we log off. And I love it because everybody's spoken about talent today and it's incredible because it's very true. And uh, they, the, the person says she agrees and she asks, how are you working to increase the collaboration between Mexican and Canadian universities that offer training and that can offer a lot of talent and provide very good results? I think that's something, yes, that the embassy might have to answer, but also, we would have to work with universities and ask them how how they could help and how, what they've done. Does anybody know anything about that? Well, we were in preparation for this event. We were talking about the fact that at least at Centro, there is no exchange program between Canadian universities and Centro, which would to tell you the truth, be a good opportunity for us to start to do this collaboration with, with scripts, with an exchange of students, of uh, Canadian students coming into Mexico and the other way around. And so, yes, yes, we should start to look at all of this at different levels so that we can start to introduce this, this, this whole process and, and continue with the distribution process. But yes, that is something we're already looking into. All right. Thank you very much, Fernanda. Thank you, everybody. The, the, this, this is the end of the session. Thank you, everybody, for joining us in this fourth webinar uh, that we will be continuing until late May. And then remember that we'll be providing you with the contact information of all of the people that have been joining us. This has been a very interesting and motivating type of conversation. And 
And I'm sure that they will be very helpful for Canadian companies to understand the many opportunities they can have here in Mexico. Hope to see you next time in the next webinar, which is going to be dealing with the editorial design sector. Thank you very much. And thank you for being a part of Panorama Creativo. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.